United with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors, serving throughout the Border Valley community, and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation by KSE Channel 38 Christian Television. And now, United with Christ. Good morning and thank you for joining us today on United with Christ. I'm Alexandra Swan. I'm here with Joyce Swan and we are here to talk to you today. We're going to talk to you about spiritual warfare and about our new book, The Force, uh, and share some things with you. Our scripture for today is from Ephesians. It's Ephesians 6, chapter 6, verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And we're going to talk about spiritual warfare, about so many things going on in the world today. There is, I think most of us who know the Lord would agree that there is terrible warfare and that we have so many struggles and how we approach that as believers, to be able to approach it without a spirit of fear, which the Bible says God has not given us. I'm here with Joyce Swan. Joyce, would you like to lead us in the opening prayer? I certainly would. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for the privilege of coming to you in prayer. It's the most powerful weapon that we have. And I pray that you will help us to learn to use prayer more effectively and to expect those prayers to be answered to not come to you as a last resort, but as a first resort. And we pray that you will be with us today, that you will anoint this program, and that you will bless all who are watching it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. When we were on this program, we got the privilege of hosting this program in December. When we were on this program, we had, we had published our new book, but we hadn't brought a copy with us. So our newest book today is The Force, and it was published in October, and it is about power versus force, the power of God versus the forces of Satan. So I want to talk a little bit about what that means. And I wanted Joyce to talk to us about power versus force because she wrote the opening of the book. There's a, there's a, there's a prologue and an epilogue in this story. The story is fiction. It's a sequel. It's a, part of our series, The Kingdom Chronicles. And it's a sequel to a book that we wrote a number of years ago called The Fourth Kingdom, which is about... Um, science about cloning and about the struggle between good and evil and that book was actually a top four finalist in the 2011 christianity today fiction of the year awards so the book was actually written in 1989 it was published in 2010 and then in 2013 we wrote the force but she opens with this this epi uh, prologue and then it ends with an epilogue kind of along the same theme and it has to do with power versus force so i wanted you to talk about that well when we decided to use the force as the title of the book we began discussing what that really meant. And in the book, the force is Satan. And the, all of the things that Satan does and all of the way he uses that limited amount of control that he has on this earth. And so if you are talking about the Satan's forces, you have to also talk about God's power because God, God's power is what balances Satan's forces and overcomes them. Uh, the prologue to the book goes back to the first book, The Fourth Kingdom, and it goes back to the time when the two uh, of the main characters in this book, who are identical twin boys, were small children. And they become afraid because the, their Sunday school teacher tells them that uh, if they're bad, the devil will get them. And that upsets them. So they ask their father about that. And he assures them that the devil can't get them because they're Christians. And then he explains to them the difference between power and force. The, epil the prologue is only a couple of pages long. But he tells these little boys that Satan has no power. All power belongs to God. But Satan can do destructive things, but he doesn't have the creative power that God has. And he explains this in terms of natural disasters such as hurricanes, fires. He can destroy things. He uses his force to destroy, to tear down, but he never creates anything because Satan doesn't have that creative power which gives life. And uh, then we end with an epilogue which goes back to that and redefines it. But this is a, such an important theme in the book because really the theme of the book is power versus 
force. And as, as uh, Christians even, we tend to believe that this force is so great that it will overcome us, that it will rule. And that's just not true. It's God's power that's always in control. And the book deals with how the characters in the book overcome those forces of Satan through the power of God. You know, I think it's really interesting. You talk about in the book, because you wrote this part, about the destructive forces in the world, tornadoes that come in and destroy everything. They never build a town. A tornado never builds a town, but it can destroy a town, a hurricane. I don't know how many people saw this. I don't even know if you saw this, but yesterday on uh, HuffPo, there was a picture that somebody had snapped of this horrible wave coming in. It was very destructive. And, it, and the wave is a man's face. And it's very interesting because you can see this man's, the profile of a man's face. It's a huge wave crashing in. And it really scared people because it's so clear that you can see this man's face in this picture. And, and we see all of these things. Sometimes we feel like the f force of, of politics, of life, of the economy of the devil is just coming at us and there's nothing we can do about it. And we tend to, even though God is all powerful, we tend to not see his power so much because his power works differently than force. It doesn't usually come in as a crashing wave. It usually comes in in the prayers of people, in the work of people, in, in the things that we do through faith as believers. And it's usually a very different dynamic. And so while it's a lot stronger and a lot more enduring, the force is a lot scarier. And, and if you haven't seen the picture, you need to see the picture. You can see, find it on the internet, uh, face and wave. You can probably do that in a search engine and see it because it is very amazing. And, and it's kind of scary to think that there is some sort of spiritual thing that's causing this wave to come in and destroy everything. Uh, I, I think that sounds very scary. I did not see it, <laughs> but I'm sure that I will look that up. Uh, one of, one of the things that we, we talk about in this book is how the power of God is always there. And I think maybe that's the reason that we are actually less aware of it. Because we have God sustaining us even before we acknowledge Him as our Savior. When people are saved and they begin to look back on their lives, they see how many times God has actually rescued them from disaster, prevented disaster in their lives, helped them when they needed help most. And he's always there. But God is, while he has all power, is very gentle and very comforting. And I think that people tend to not pay as much attention because if they have something that scares them, they will pay more attention to that. So I, I, I think that this is, is one of the dynamics between power and force. But the book covers so many different elements of power and force because we get into the cloning, which carries over from the other book. And it actually takes place, This the force takes place 20 years after the um, fourth kingdom ends. So these young men, the, it, it, the other book ends on their 21st birthdays, three young men who have the same birthday and takes up 20 years later. So uh, there are a lot of changes, but the same common elements are carried over. The things that started and set all of this into motion carry over. But um, it, it's um, something that, that we really felt was important for people to see in light of the things that are happening today and to understand that we are never helpless. As Christians, we are never helpless. You know, and that's true. Um, one of the things that we got an email comment about, and, and I'd like for you to comment on this because it's your because it's your theory, and I I did not use to embrace this as charismatics. My parents were in the charismatic movement, the Jesus movement in the 70s, and so I grew up with that background. A lot of people who are in the Jesus movement tend to believe that God is um, you know, very active in your life, as active as you want him to be. But that the Antichrist is coming and Jesus is returning. We all believe that Jesus is returning. It's part of a you know, fundamental Christianity. But also to believe that God is, you know, really active. He really wants to act in your life. But there's a point at which he's going to stop acting because it's just too, too, too late. And, you know, it, how do you balance that? Because we got a comment. From, we talk about in the book, you have this theory that the Antichrist comes when people stop 
trying to stand against it. When the Christians stop praying, when they stop working, when they stop standing up, that's when he comes. And until that point, the Antichrist won't come. And, and the, your reference for that is, uh, I think it's Thessalonians, where Paul says, we know what is holding him back. The spirit of Antichrist is in the world. It's, the Bible says that in several places. It says it in the, in the epistle of John. I think it's First John. It also says it in Thessalonians. The spirit of Antichrist is at work in the world. So we know the spirit of Antichrist was at work in the world in the first century. We actually know from reading the Bible carefully, the spirit of Antichrist has been in the work, at work in the world since the Garden of Eden because yes. the goal of the serpent was to get people to take on the powers of God and the attributes of God. So how do you, how do you reconcile this idea that we know the Lord is coming back with, with this idea that we can hold back the Antichrist? And tell, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I began to believe this several years ago just from reading the Bible. That was, that was my source for believing it. But um, Jesus himself, when they asked him when the end would come, he said that only the Father knows. He said, even I don't know. So why would that be true? Because he was God. And to me that indicates that perhaps there is not a set date where God has already set a date. Perhaps it's up to us. It will happen. It will happen exactly the way the Bible says it will happen. But maybe it's up to us when it happens. And the more I have studied the scriptures, the more I have begun to believe that we, God has given us the power to push this back through our vigilance, through our prayers, through our sharing Christ with other people, and when we decide to give up and say, it's over, I'm tired, I'm not going to do this anymore, then he can come. There's a prayer number on the screen. If you'd like to call in for prayer, it's 532-8518. And you can call in uh, and talk to somebody about your prayer request right now. Let's talk about the importance of prayer because that's really what, what holds all of this back. And that's what spiritual warfare is. Our scripture today was about wrestling against evil in high places. And there's a lot of evil in high places right now, all over the world, uh, worldwide. And we talk about this in the force too. The, not just in terms of our country, but in terms of globalism. There's terrible evil that is trying to come in in the world. And that has always been there, just as the spirit of Antichrist has always been there. How do you, how do you stay in prayer and hold that back? effectively over a long period of time? What, what can one person really do if all that person can do is pray? Well, and I think that the, there is a huge misconception about what one person can do even with prayer because people talk about, well, if you happen to be homebound, you can always pray. If you happen to be a person who's too old to do anything else, you can always pray. As if the you can always pray is something you do if you're unable to do anything else as, again, a last resort. But that's not the last resort. That's the first resort. Without prayer, it doesn't really matter what else you do. If you're going to have a street ministry, if you're going to have a pulpit, if you're going to work in an office, if you don't shore it up with prayer, you're not going to have any results. So all of us need to be in prayer. We need to have a certain time set aside each day where we pray and we pray believing that God is going to hear those prayers, that he's going to answer those prayers, that he is going to act on our behalf and on the behalf of those we pray for. You know, when you really give yourself up to prayer, God starts to put wonderful uh, opportunities in your path. I have a, a friend in Virginia who happened to go onto our website and saw an email address for me and emailed me personally. And she and I have never met, we have never talked on the phone, but she had a real genuine prayer need uh, over a health issue with her little grandson. And she asked me if I would be praying for her daughter and her little grandson and her family. And I began to pray and we are still emailing each other about once a week and it's almost a year now. And she has become a dear friend to me, even though I've never met her, because I was willing to pray for her. And because she was willing to step out and say, will you pray for me? So this is something that changes things. Prayer 
changes everything. It changes you. If you have someone you don't like very well and you start to pray for them, you'll start liking them better. If you have, it's not just a matter of, well, I want to stop hating them. You'll start forgiving them. You'll start caring about them. You'll start having their best interests at heart. Uh, prayer brings opportunity. It uh, can push back the things that are causing problems in your life. And whatever you do, you need to always pray. You just set aside a certain time for prayer because that's very important too. If you don't have a prayer time, you're probably not gonna pray every day because you're gonna to get too busy. Um, off, for years, a couple of years, I prayed as I drove to work every day because I knew it was 25 minutes each way. And I would pray all the way there, all the way home. It was a wonderful time. I was alone in the car, no radio, no nothing. And I would pray. Now I've, I've had to set aside a different prayer time, but it's very important to have scheduled times to know when you pray. If you wake up in the middle of the night, you can't sleep. Good time to pray. But have your things that you hold up, the things that God has put on your heart, and pray for the people and the situations, and you will see things change. Because when the Christians stop doing that, when the Christians say, well, the world has gotten so evil that there's nothing we can do, the Antichrist will come. Well, and I think we see a lot, of, a lot of that right now where people are very discouraged and they say, well, the Lord is coming soon. Well, we know he is coming soon, mm -hmm. but we also know his time is different from ours because they knew he was coming soon in the first century too. And a day is, a thousand years is but a day to the Lord. So we know he's coming soon, but we, that doesn't negate our responsibilities. And I think one thing that a lot of people who have not been Christians very long, or maybe have been Christians, but maybe haven't had a very serious walk, experience, because everybody experiences this, as you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray for something and that prayer is not answered. And, and it's clearly not answered. And the person does die or you do lose the business or whatever it was that you were praying about happens. You know, it, what you wanted didn't happen. Does that mean that God didn't hear that prayer? No. And it doesn't even mean, it doesn't even mean necessarily that he didn't answer the prayer. If the person is saved, and you're praying for them to get well and to be well, well, they're well with him. You know, he sees things differently than we do. If you're praying for, you know, an, a way out of your financial distress that you're in and, and what he does is, you know, cause you to lose your business, well, maybe, maybe he's going to give you that, but not in this. Part of prayer is trusting God. And if you are in a situation where you're really, really praying for something and it doesn't happen, that doesn't mean he didn't hear you. It doesn't mean he didn't care, and it doesn't, mean he, it doesn't even mean he didn't answer. It just means he didn't answer the way you thought he would answer. And I think that's just one reason people get discouraged and give up, is they say, well, he doesn't answer me, so what good does it do? And I, I think that this comes back to where the Bible says, occupy until I come. You can't occupy if you give up. Now we're the original occupiers. We really we are. are. The, the, yeah. We are the occupation force. We're supposed yeah. to stand firm. We're supposed to stay in prayer. And we're supposed to change things. And our prayers do change things. Often they don't turn out the way we thought they would. But they do change things. And as we stay in prayer, our whole country can change. We have an opportunity this year in 2014 to really begin to change things in this country, to set the course for this country, to set the course for where this country is going to go, and to put people in power who know the Lord and who love the Lord and who want to see us return to a constitutional republic. But that's not going to happen unless we pray and unless we work. And if we say, well, the Lord's coming back, it doesn't matter, then we've just vacated our responsibilities and said, well, we don't have to do anything because he's coming back. And he has told us and, and reassured us and promised us that he is coming back. But he has also said, you occupy until I come. And if you occupy, you have to hold that ground. <clears throat> you don't retreat. You don't say, well, I think, I think that Satan's pretty much already got this. So let's move this way. You say, no, 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 no. I'm keeping this. I'm holding this line. I'm not giving up. This ground belongs to God's people, and we're not giving up. 
one of the best sermons I ever heard was about that uh, over at uh, our church. The, uh, one of the guest pastors preached about this, about being a mighty man or woman of God. And his text was David's three mighty men. And one of them held a field of lentils. And it stood by himself fighting the Philistines and held a field of lentils. And the, the pastor's point was that every time you give up any piece of ground, it becomes part of the kingdom of darkness. Anything that you give up becomes part of his kingdom. And it's always harder to get it back than it was to keep it in the first place. Mm -hmm. We spent last week in Dallas, Texas. We were there and, and we saw my sister's new church because she lives in Dallas, um, is on a hill called Prayer Mountain. It's a very, very interesting, beautiful area. We went up there and took some photographs and it's just gorgeous. But she was telling us a little bit of the story about Prayer Mountain, that the, these people bought this mountain because God told them to many years ago. And it's, it's this amazing view lot in Dallas. And, of course, it's wintertime right now, but you can look over the lake and you can look over the trees. It's just gorgeous. It's uh, over 100 acres, I think she yes, said. Yes, it is. Over 100 acres in Dallas. And then after they bought it, they didn't know what God wanted them to do with it. They didn't know what to do. But then they found out it had been, it had been a place for witches. And witches went up there and did all kinds of ceremonies on that mountain. And it really does overlook the city, so it was very significant. And when they bought it, they, they made it into a place of prayer. And so when you go up there now in Prayer Mountain in Dallas, it has uh, the scripture, my house should be a place of prayer for all nations. People come from all over the world to pray. They have a very inexpensive, very affordable place where people can have weddings and a community center and, and all, a place for children to play and just all kinds of things to bring prayer and family and things that glorify what God is doing. And, and when she was telling us this story, I kept thinking, you know, it's so much God's heart and God's nature to redeem everything. He wants to redeem everything in your life. He wants to redeem everything in this world. And this is one piece of ground that he took back for himself because it was something that Satan had that he redeemed and reclaimed. And that's always so much his heart for everything. And I, today I just want to encourage anybody who's watching who has a prayer need, a prayer request, please call the number on the screen, 532-8518, and ask for prayer because you may feel a little timid. You may feel that your prayer isn't important enough. It's important to God. He wants you to ask for prayer. So if you have a prayer need, please call in. Please share that need. You can do it anonymously. You don't have to give your name. But please let someone pray with you uh, because God will act. God and, acts through prayer. And you can connect with this station on Facebook and on Twitter. This is, it's important to be in a community of believers. If you're watching today, and maybe you're a new Christian, or maybe you're not a Christian yet, but you're watching this program, it's, it's really important to connect with the community of believers. God has called us together through Christ to be the body of Christ, which means we are supposed to work together as a family and be there for each other. When you're going through hard times, it can be, you can feel really alone. And so many people have problems because they do feel alone. They don't know what to do. And when you get with other believers and you experience their struggles, part of what you experience is their stories of prayers that didn't get answered. But you know what? They're still with it. They're still there. They're still hanging in there because they trust that God has a better future for them than what they left behind. And they're able to see that and they're able to keep going. And they're able to keep going with their walk. And it will help you in your walk, even, even if your walk hasn't started yet. Because it truly is God's heart to redeem every person. The Bible says it is His will that no one should perish. To redeem every place, to redeem our country. I really believe that. I, I believe that the problems in our country are not because God doesn't care. They're because we don't care. And His heart is always for the, for the good. His heart is always for redemption. His heart is always for salvation. It's just whether, whether we get in line with that or not is up to us. Well, and the Bible says that God's ways are not our ways. So often we have an idea of what God should do in our lives to make it perfect. God has a much better plan for you than you will ever have for yourself. You will never be able to create as good a plan as the plan that God already has. So I think this is something important to remember too, is to pray to do the part that you can do, <clears throat> excuse me, to work, to uh, bring about good things in your life, but to trust God that his plan is the superior plan and that he, if you are faithful, will bring that plan to fruition in your life. Absolutely. 
and and watch him work it out because he does want to work things out. But but he only but he only works in connection with us. You know, mm -hmm. God made all things; He can do all things. He doesn't do all things. He's entrusted part of it to us, and the part that we don't do either doesn't get done at all or he'll get somebody else to do it. He will never force you to do no. anything. He's not going to wrestle you to the ground. No, he's not. And he's not going to make you, he's not going to make you do things. God doesn't make you do things. The story of Jonah is a real anomaly in the Bible. It's not, that's not the standard. The standard is, if you don't want it, I'll get it to somebody who does. I want to take this time to say our closing prayer today because we're almost out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. Please continue. The prayer line, I believe, will stay open and certainly the social networking sites stay open. So you can call this station and ask for prayer and ask for help. And you can also connect with us at our website at Frontier2000.net. Let's join in the closing prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this opportunity to be together and to talk about you and to talk about spiritual warfare. Help us all to be faithful warriors to do the work that you've called us to do, to stand up for the truth, to stand up for freedom, to stand up for you. We thank you so much for the life that you've given us, and we ask you to help us as we go into our weekend. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. Have a wonderful weekend. Watching United with Christ. We pray this has been a blessing to you, and we invite you to tune in again tomorrow. We invite your comments, questions, or prayer requests. You may contact us at KSE Christian Television, 2201 East Wyoming Avenue, El Paso, Texas 79903, or call us at. Please consider partnering with us so that together, KSCE Life can continue to broadcast the best Christian programs for your viewing enjoyment and blessing. Contributions can be sent to KSCE Life Christian Television or through our website or by phoning the office Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Together, we will make a difference.